Lord, thank you so much for this morning, chance to gather together in your name, uh, for giving us a place that has heat and vehicles that, that arrive here and a parking lot that's plowed and an ability to uh, see and rejoice in, in your goodness in all things, even in the chaos of the weather around us and a, a great reminder, a humbling reminder of how small we are and, and yet you and your goodness uh, care about us. And so I pray that it would cause us to uh, grow in a deeper and more appreciative faith than you would desire to follow you in all things. Pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Kindergarten through fifth graders, young people, you can head off to children's worship. For the rest of us, you can grab a Bible. Go with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16 is where we're going to spend our time this morning. Uh, you know, I always think when the weather is, is this terrible, I've got negative six right now. Actually, 15 minutes ago, I had negative eight. So we're we're getting better as the day goes on. But uh, I, I always want to remind myself that this is not the first time, and it's not the last time it'll be this bad. Uh, in fact, if you remember, a few years ago, uh, we had what was known as the polar vortex. You remember that? Like, that was like a phrase that we had to use because it was cold enough that we were like, we got to have some type of term for this. It was like negative 50 wind chills for a couple days, and they said, like, you know, something was unique about that year. Uh, I remember that year really well because a few weeks after that, I went, uh, in the middle of the week, I went up to the upper peninsula of Michigan with a good friend of mine who was from Michigan. We'd met up there, and we decided we are going to do like a, a winter, like guys, outdoor hike, uh, cross-country ski type of trip, something like that, which is kind of dumb. I'd never cross-country ski before in my life. I don't know why I thought that was going to work out well. Uh, and, and so we just decided we would, you know, leave our wife and kids at home to deal with whatever that was while we were out playing basketball. I, Monday night, I, I won't see Dirk there, I guess. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just teasing, just teasing. But uh, we we decided we'd head up to the Upper Peninsula. Uh, I'd been up there as a kid, um, and one of, the, one of the best places growing up was to go to the Pictured Rocks. Anybody been to the Pictured Rocks before on Lake Superior? Just Cheryl? Oh, man. We need like a church camping trip in the summer uh, to go, go see. It's incredible. So the Lake Superior Along the coast of the Upper Peninsula in Lake Superior, there is a, a certain, certain part of the coastline that is set up in such a way that you just have these massive cliff sides uh, dug into the rocks, but through the different layers of sediment, they have all of these kind of wild colors inside of the cliffs. And so uh, you can go, and, and there's, a, there's a park there and an opportunity. You can kind of like hike down, you can watch, and you can just see miles of rocky cliffside. And it's, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful things you can ever imagine. And so uh, we had been there growing up. My parents used to love to go up there on vacation. So we, we take a trip and we go up there, uh, my friend Matt and I, and we, we decide we're going to go walk to the pictured rocks and like view what it looks like in the middle of the winter with all of this snow on the ground and all of this chaos. Except that when we drive up, you get to the road, and it's about four miles away. It's, in fact, it's exactly four miles away, according to the sign. And the road is no longer plowed. And you can see, like it ramps up, and the snow is, I mean, that tall, right? And, and it says, seasonal road, proceed with caution, which, which really means don't proceed. Uh, and so we kind of park, and we're trying to decide, like, what do we do? Because we really want to get there, and we're only four miles away, and, um, and so we consider driving, like we have a four-wheel drive vehicle, and we're like, ah, you know, maybe, and uh, as we consider this, somebody comes by on some snowmobiles, and they go, oh yeah, some crazy people in an all-wheel drive up there drove all the way up and got out and viewed the rocks, and then their car sunk in the snow, and they couldn't get out, and it's $300 a mile for the big track loader to come get them, and we're like, we don't have the money to risk that, so we decide we're going to walk. And so we, we take off in, and think, four miles is not that far to walk. In snow boots, <laughs> in this deep of snow. And I mean, it took, us, it took us the whole day to walk there. And one thing I remember doing was like every half mile, which took 
25, 30, 40 minutes to walk a half mile, and you're just exhausted, and you're wearing all this snow gear, and you're trying not to sweat underneath the snow gear because you know that's going to be bad, but every single step feels like pain, and it's just one road, but every half mile, we'd stop, we'd take a break, and there was one thing specifically we would do, because you don't have any cell service out there, is like we would grab, we had a physical map, and you'd take the map out every half mile, and you'd look at the map just to make sure that you're on the right road. One road, still not confident we're on the right road. Because at, at the worst, like you're just walking the wrong direction for miles and miles and miles. You know you got to backtrack it like at some point. And so I remember this trip taking so long. In fact, the one thing that was really great about it is after we actually got there and how fulfilling that was, uh, we found a guy who had a snowmobile with a sled tied behind it. And for five bucks a piece, we could sit on the sled and he would taxi us back to our car. <laughs> like That's the best money I've ever spent. It was so cold and awful and, uh, and I'm sitting with my other adult male friend like holding on to him on a little tiny sled. <laughs> Listen, didn't matter to me. But the one thing I, I specifically remember about that was, was all of these times, there's one road and yet constantly you're stopping and going, are we on the right path? Are we on the right road? Let's just check the directions and make sure. And, and really, uh, what we're hoping to do over the course of this being the third week, and then we'll, we'll do this again next week, is uh, in January, taking some time as a church just to, just to look at the map and go, hey, are we on the path we said we're supposed to be on? Are, are we really, as a church, set upon the mission that is, that is given to us by the Lord for us, empowering us to go and to be his witnesses, to gather together as the saints, and to grow together in our faith. We've, we've said uh, over the course of several years that the goal of the church, the role of the church, is to glorify God and praise him in all things. How do we do that? Well, we express that in this kind of phrase, we, we go, make disciples, we gather together as his saints, and we grow in our faith. And so uh, we've, we've just kind of taken some time over the last few weeks to sit, to chat. It's really kind of a practical uh, look at what we're doing as a church body and, and how we're accomplishing these things and what specifically we need to be working on or doing better in order to grow in these areas. And so we're going to continue that here in the month of January, just kind of asking these questions like, are we on mission? What does it really look like to do these things? What, is it, what does it look like to be a people who are, and today specifically, growing in our faith? How, how do we grow in our faith and how do we grow better and better and better in our understanding of what it means to know and to follow Christ? Now, let me, let me add one more thing before we jump into the book of Acts to kind of observe what the Scripture has to say about this. Um, we've, we've tried to answer this question this year in a collective sense over an individual sense. So, how are we doing these things as a community versus how are we doing these things as individuals. And so a couple weeks ago when we talked about what does it look like to go make disciples, uh, we spoke about how that was entrusted to the church as, as a cooperative understanding of what it looks like to be evangelistic. That it wasn't that each one of us would go out on our own, but rather that God had specifically chosen, empowered, and uses us as believers within the church working together for the sake of the gospel. So much so that Jesus says, hey listen, if you would have love for one another, the world will know you're my disciples. If you and I, if we're one in our unity with each other, the world will know that the Father has sent the Son. The world will believe through our unity, through our understanding and connection to one another, that in and of itself will be evangelistic. And so uh, we said it's, it's kind of a communal, not individual aspect. And then we, we talked about gathering together, and we said over and over again last week that church is not just a place you attend, but it's a community you're a part of. And so uh, while it's awesome that some of you were able to be here and attend this morning, uh, and others are, are joining us on the computer and and warm and safe at home, like the community of the church exists in 
all of the contexts that we might find ourselves together, so much so that we're really a people who care for one another, and in doing so, we desire to see the Lord honored and glorified in each of our lives and and then our lives together. And so we'll we'll continue that process today. Here's why I think this is is such a difficult thing for us, though. I remember uh, speaking to a friend who had grown up in Japan, kind of understood Eastern culture, and he said, you know, the thing that was really crazy when I moved back to America as an adult was they have this proverb in the U.S., the squeaky wheel, yeah, gets the grease, gets the oil, I don't know, I guess what, depends on what you use, right? But uh, it's, it's a recognition that, like, if you really want something, sometimes you got to complain. Amen? Right? Like, and anybody that's called customer service on an 800 number understands how that works, right? And he said, here's the thing, the difference, the difference is, in Japan, the proverb was, the protruding nail gets hammered. Yeah. And so, so the whole culture understood this, that individualism wouldn't be seen as above the community, right? Whereas, whereas in our culture, I think we, we always see and view ourselves individually first and communally second. And, and the challenge is, in the scripture, both things are appraised as really important at times. And so, so I want to just kind of, as we look at the book of Acts, here's, here's what we're going to do. How do we grow in our faith? I want to put it in the context of a case study in an early church and go, the book of Acts tells us all about these early churches and what it looked like for them to develop and what it looked like for them to know and follow Christ. Like, how did this look together in their pursuit of the Lord and their growth in Christ? And so, keeping a collective mindset on it, let's, let's look at it. Acts chapter 16, we'll start off in verse 11, give you a little background. We'll, we'll read through the chapter and, and speak to the church. Specifically, this is the church in Philippi, the recipient of the letter to the Philippians, uh, and it, it marks their very beginning. And we'll, we'll just pick out some things that show us what it looks like to grow in our faith in Christ. It says, so putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and on the following day, Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. So Paul and a group of missionary companions of his are traveling. The the Bible tells us just before this that they actually intend to go north rather than west, and yet uh, by the forbidden nature of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they end up in the city of Philippi. And it says they're staying there for some days, so they're, they're kind of restocking, replenishing Philippi as a large leading city. It's, it's a busy place where there's a lot of resources, and so they're, they're hanging out there getting ready to head to their next place. So the, the intention is that they're not going to be here a long time, but rather uh, to prepare for where they're going next. While they're there, here's what happens. They end up staying at least one weekend, and it says on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So they go, they find some people gathered, figured, you know, we'll go out somewhere, there'll be some people getting together for church. Somebody's out there praying and we'll find them and we'll talk to them about Christ if we get an opportunity. And the Bible says in verse 14, a woman named Lydia From the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So let's pause here. Um, Here's what happens. There's a a woman named Lydia, uh, near and dear to us. as we, We named our second daughter after this woman of the scripture. She's a businesswoman, a seller of purple goods. In fact, in those times, uh, it was very expensive and very difficult to dye fabric the color purple. And so anybody who did that was uh, normally of specific wealth. Uh, To buy purple fabric would have meant you were well off, perhaps even of some type of royal lineage. And so Lydia is a dealer in this, uh, has 
some type of decent business opportunities, and it says she's a worshiper of God. So not connected to the gospel, but knows that there is a God out there, and she desires to know him. Paul begins to preach the gospel, and then this is where it begins in our faith journey, or what it looks like to grow in faith, is her heart is transformed. Growing in faith comes from a heart that is transformed by the gospel. It says the Lord opens her heart to receive the gospel, that he takes and changes her, that she has faith in Christ, and that her life now begins differently almost immediately. Now, here's the thing. As we kind of pull this out 2,000 years later in our lives, um, One of the things, when we talk about what it means to grow in Christ, one of the things that I think becomes a natural reaction for us is to think like, well, I ought to be reading my Bible more. I ought to be praying more. I ought to go to church more. I ought to be nicer to my spouse. I ought to be more patient with my kids. I ought to be a little more disciplined in my reactions, I ought to watch my language. The list goes on and on and on and on and on of all the things we ought to be doing. Amen? You with me? And and like we hit this phase of the year, in fact, we're like right in the next two weeks is when most people give up on their New Year's resolutions, right? But like we're in this phase of the year where, where you're kind of clutching on to a lot of things that you ought to be doing. And, and the way that most people in our culture tend to view Christianity is the same. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, well, Christians, you know, don't have as bad a language as the rest of the world. And Christians are more moral in their sexual ethic. And Christians are uh, people who go to church every week. And Christians are people who read their Bible. And Christians are people who pray. And Christians are people who do X, Y, and Z and don't do A, B, and C. Amen? That's, that's how most of the world answers what it means to be a Christian. In fact, that's how a lot of Christians answer what it means to be a Christian. But ultimately, what the Bible says about what it means to be a Christian is it's somebody whose heart has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. What it means to be a Christian does not begin at all with behaviors. In fact, one of the ways that you could assure that you won't actually grow in your faith, grow in your relationship with Christ, grow as a Christian, is focus all of your energy on self-disciplined behaviors rather than knowing Jesus Christ. Now, here's the the reality. None of those things are problematic things. And and in general, doing those things is going to help you given the prerequisite that you know Christ. I mean, here's, here's the reality in my life. I should pray more. I should read the Bible more. I should be a better husband. I should be a better parent. I should be a better pastor. I should be a better friend. All of those things are true. And, and the reality is all of those things are true in your life as well. However, what it looks like to grow in all of those areas are growing in light of the transforming relationship in Jesus Christ. Amen? That first and foremost, what it looks like to grow in our faith is to have a heart that is transformed by the gospel. And and when we really know and trust the gospel, it begins to change our motivations. It begins to change the way that we see and attack how we're going to live our lives. It begins to change what it looks like to really follow the Lord in the spiritual disciplines of our life, doing this so that we might please Christ rather than doing this so that we can check off some box of behavior that we have somehow accomplished. Amen? You with me there? Now watch, watch what it does though. Very next verse. Lydia uh, has had her heart opened to respond to the things spoken by Paul and she and her household are baptized. So they they respond, and it says, She urges us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And then I like this sentence that follows it up. It says, And she prevailed upon us. 
that, that it wasn't just, hey, well, you can stay at my house, but rather that there's an insistence so much that she prevails upon them. She convinces them, stay here so that we might watch the gospel go forth in the city of Philippi. Remember, it says they were staying there for some days. They, they weren't intending to be there a long time. They had simply wandered outside of the city on the Sabbath day and said, well, while we're here, we might as well preach. And she goes, hey, stay here. Make some camp here. You can enjoy my house so that you can go forth and preach the gospel. Be here, because here's what happens. When we grow in our faith, it produces in us a spirit of generosity and a spirit of hospitality. Amen? When, when we're growing in our faith, we ought to become more generous people. And we ought to become more hospitable people. And, and here's the thing, like, I think our culture misunderstands this word more and more and more by the year, right? Hospitality is, is not... Uh, it's not, it's not owned by Martha Stewart, right? It's not about how good your food is or how well decorated your home is. Though, you know, I guess you could make good food and decorate well and it would make you more hospitable, perhaps. Uh, but ultimately, hospitality and generosity are these intimately connected ideas that we have a heart that sees and cares deeply for others. Here's what's going on in Lydia's mind. is She goes... I've received this transformative gospel, and, and my family has received it, my household has received it, and these are the guys who are speaking it forth, and they seem to have this understanding of life that not only do I want, but, but I want to care for them in such a way that they could propel this out into the whole city, the whole area that I live in. Please, stay with us. There's a generosity and a hospitality. Here's, here's the thing. If, if you find yourself as a particularly self-oriented, stingy, or judgmental person, ultimately, as you assess that in your life, here's, here's the question. Is that changing at all? Does, does your relationship with Christ transform that day by day? Now, the, the reality is nobody has every day better than the last. But the, the truth of the gospel is that it ought to make us a people who are less selfish. It ought to make us a people who are more generous. It ought to make us a people who care deeply for others. That's what it means to grow in our faith. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Uh, they do stay. She prevails upon them, and they begin to go and preach into the city of Philippi. Uh, Lydia is well received, dignified within the city. Uh, the next converts are not quite the same. In fact, let's, let's just read and listen to what happens next. It says, it happens that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. So, we don't have time to unfold all of this situation, but uh, there is a girl who is owned by some men who are selling her out to tell people's fortunes and finding that it's quite profitable. It's actually an evil spirit that has possessed her, and so she is following after Paul and the rest of us, and she keeps crying out saying, these men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. Again, a lot going on here. You can, we could explain it over lunch sometime. But uh, ultimately, Paul goes, get the demon out of this girl. And it does. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. 
And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So I I would say it's safe to say that things go badly uh, pretty quickly for Paul and Silas and the others who are with them. That they're preaching... uh, The name of Jesus is actually being declared by this little slave girl with an evil spirit in her. Paul casts out this spirit and the men who see this, and this isn't the only time this happens in Scripture. In fact, this this same model is going to show up again in Ephesus when they're uh, compelled to uh, fight against them because their business of idol worship is starting to be disturbed by Paul and the others. They go, hey, this guy's screwing things up for us. Can we throw him in jail? And the magistrates go, well, yeah, we can, but let's beat them first. And so they get some rods out, and they start whacking them with rods, and then they throw them into a prison, and they bind them in stocks in the inner prison. Now get this. Here's what I think we miss sometimes in the reading of the Scripture. For following the will of the Lord. Amen? Right? Like, not for doing something wrong, not for... Uh, finding themselves lacking wisdom, not for taking a wrong direction or a wrong turn. They're trusting and following the Lord, and they end up in an inner prison. Now, now here's what's really amazing about this. Verse 25 says this, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Here's, here's a sign of what it looks like to really grow in your faith. Growing in your faith means that you're praising the Lord, whatever the circumstances. When, when we're maturing in Christ, we get better and better at recognizing that our relationship with Christ supersedes the circumstances of our life. Amen? Here's, here's culturally, I think, one of the biggest misunderstandings and problems that that we have in the entire United States today is that, generally speaking, most people you run into are either having a really good day, really good week, really good month, or a really bad day, really bad week, really bad month. And the determination of that is generally things that are completely out of their control. Generally speaking, we exist in a culture that has learned that if things go right, you should be happy and healthy and life is awesome. And if things go wrong, it ought to be the opposite. You ask someone how they're doing, they go, well, okay, considering the circumstances. As if we would be so shocked to believe that circumstances would ever go wrong, would ever be bad, would ever be unfortunate for us. And then people who find themselves in a series of good circumstances, one, we we have a tendency to always kind of take credit for those things and feel like we had a lot of responsibility in them, kind of neglect the understanding of grace and how it was involved in those blessings. But two, we find ourselves in really good moods until things go wrong. And yet, here's, here's where you see Paul and Silas and believers in the early church responding differently. They've, they've been beaten with rods and thrown unlawfully into prison. And here they are singing hymns of praise to the Lord and for the sake of the other prisoners. Because, because they understand something that we as believers ought to understand. That if, if you are trusting in Christ, nothing in this world could shatter your hope. Nothing in this world. And, if you are trusting in Christ, nothing in this world could realize your hope. You get that? There's, there's nothing that could happen. You could win the lottery. It would not be a better day for you than the day that your heart, like Lydia, was transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you could be beaten with rods and thrown into an inner prison and it wouldn't be a hope-shattering day. I'm not saying it wouldn't be a reason to be a little frustrated. Amen. But joy, not a motive joy, real joy, praises the Lord regardless of our circumstances. 
It's a recognition that we have a salvation in Him that guides us through this life, knowing our hope isn't rooted here. It's not grounded here. That we can endure in whatever circumstances. That we can walk forth in whatever circumstances. And that even when circumstances are in our favor, we don't find ourselves rejoicing first and foremost in the circumstances, but rejoicing in the Lord. I I remember um, several years ago, in fact, uh, it was right before I moved out here, 2015, I had a privilege to lead a short-term mission team to Monterey, Mexico. And uh, we went down there in May, uh, which is hot in Michigan and Wisconsin. It was torching hot in Monterey. I like thinking about it on days like today, honestly. It's 106 degrees, I think, the day that we got there and landed and drove in. Uh, it was a particularly meaningful trip. It was one, one of the, uh, I took the trip with my younger brother. And so, in this, I lost my brother a year ago, and so thinking about it now is just a, a particularly special thing. Um, we got there, we flew in, we arrived at one in the afternoon. 106 degrees, and we drove to the site that we were supposed to be at, and we're all in our, like, travel clothes, and, and honestly, like, I did not expect us to be doing anything other than, like, getting acquainted with where we were going to stay that day, uh, and as we arrived at the site and kind of, kind of pile out, I'm like, all right, where do we unload the luggage and stuff? The missionary, uh, Mauricio, who went by Mao, he goes, well, just leave that stuff for now and come with me. Because they're pouring some concrete in this beam, and uh, they got the forms all set, and so we, we can just help them mix the concrete. <laughs> I'm like, help them mix concrete? Like, we're, we're like, we just got off a flight, man. Like, we've been in the, our luggage is still in the back of the van. He's like, oh, it'll be totally fine. He goes, all right, so you grab a shovel, and there's a pile of sand, and there's a pile of concrete, and there's a hand mixer, and there's a couple Mexican guys ready to mix the concrete going, hey, you're the grunt labor." All right, you handle this, shovel. And, and so people on the team kind of look at me. I'm like, I don't know. So start shoveling. And, and then the beam that they're pouring is 12 feet in the air. And so I said, like, so how are we getting it up there? He goes, climb. <laughs> I was like, climb, what are we talking about? It's 106 degrees. And so I start climbing up scaffolding and uh, my brother is standing on the ground, and what we did for the next four hours was people on their team shoveling, mixing, pouring into five-gallon buckets, my brother grabbing a bucket, throwing it to me, me grabbing a bucket, throwing it up to Mao, this uh, missionary, who five-gallon bucket after five-gallon bucket after five-gallon bucket is pouring a two-foot-wide by three-foot-tall by 20-foot-long concrete beam. Hours and hours and hours. 106 degrees. And and we get a couple hours in, no gloves, and and if you've ever worked with concrete and and lime, like you know, like your your hands just go raw. I mean, maybe if you're actually used to working at it and, and a real man, they don't, but mine did. Okay, like no calluses here. All right, desk job. All right, and so I'm like starting to get these chemical burns in my hands. And I'm thinking, we got to be done with this. And uh, I look at the missionary, and I'm like, Mao. He's like, like, we're getting there. And I can see, like, we're not getting there, okay? And so I'm like growing a little more frustrated, a little more frustrated, a little more frustrated. There's four clouds in the sky, like little clouds, in, in the whole sky. And like one of them passes over the sun, and what is 106 degrees gets down just for a minute to like 97. And I think, Phew. and I look at him, and I was like, I was like, you know, when it's a little shaded like this, it's actually not quite so miserable. But in just a second, when that sun goes away, I really feel like this is hell. <laughs> and I was trying not to be too frustrated and too ornery. And I, honestly, I wasn't doing a good job with it. And, and he probably had a right to be short with me, but he wasn't. He looked at me, and he smiled, 
And he said, you know, I like to think when the sun is beating down like this, it is God just smiling and sending us kisses on the cheek. <laughs> and he's like, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> I, was, I was like, you got to be kidding me. What are you talking about, man? I don't ever want to come back here again. So in July, we'll be going to Costa Rica. <laughs> you, can, you can join the mission team. We'll probably do some concrete work. Be awesome, right? And, but here's, here's why I remember this so well. Like, I, I can visualize that smile because I remember him thinking, circumstances? My joy isn't connected to circumstances. We are here with an opportunity to serve the Lord. Let's be joyous about it. Here's Paul and Silas in the inner prison praying and singing hymns of praise of God. Go on, let's rejoice in where we're at. Now, now here's where it gets awesome. It says, suddenly there came a great earthquake. All the foundations of the prison house were shaken. Immediately the doors were open. Everyone's chains were unfastened. I mean, that's, uh, you know this is, this is the providence of God at work here. It, it unfastens the chains of the prisoners. The doors blow open through the course of this earthquake. Now, it says, when the jailer awoke and he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. You see, in those days, a jailer was responsible for those prisoners, and if they had all escaped, he would have been executed anyways, and so he figures it might as well do the deed myself, but Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, don't harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights, and he rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? A great question. And, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And so they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all of his household. They come to know the Lord. And, and he brought them into his house and he set food before them. Remember, generous and hospitable. And he rejoiced greatly, having believed in God and with his whole household. Now, when the day came... The chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now. Go in peace. Paul says to them, They've beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and they've thrown us into prison, and now they're sending us away secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and bring us out. And so they report these words to the chief magistrates, and they're afraid when they hear that they're Romans. It's a significant thing in that culture. And they came and appealed to them when they had brought them out, and they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and then departed. Two, two things. Growing in faith, first of all, it causes us to see all people as brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's, here's how the church of Philippi gets started. Best we can tell, the first converts in the church in Philippi is a wealthy, well-liked, prestigious businesswoman, upper class, and then is a slave girl possessed by an evil spirit, and then is a Roman jailer in his household. That is as diverse a crowd you can imagine. They come from as different backgrounds as you could envision. They would have had almost nothing in common. And, and yet this is what happens. The church is built on a foundation of community in Jesus Christ. Because in Christ, they had all things in common, and yet, despite their various backgrounds, they're united by hearts that are transformed by the gospel. When, when we're a church that continues to grow in our faith, it's a church that recognizes and sees people, even people that look very different than us, that come from very different backgrounds than us, that see the world in different ways than us, that act differently than us. We see them as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's how we as a church can be gathering here in Darlington, Wisconsin, and all across the world today. There will be people who 
look differently, act differently, think differently, no different things who will gather and rejoice in the name of Jesus. And you and I are united in the same church with the same God worshiping together. And so the more and more we grow in Christ, the more we grow in our love for others. And specifically, like this is what I would say, specifically people who are hard to love. Right when, when Jesus is preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about this and he says, like, if you just love the people who love you in return, like, what is that? That's not divine. Even the Gentiles do that. He says, real love is to recognize and to see those who otherwise wouldn't have nothing in common with you and find the bond of unity that is in Jesus Christ. This, in fact, one of the reasons like, that is most rejoice-worthy in our church is that we look abound and go, man, not everybody looks the same. We're not all the same age. We don't come from the same backgrounds. We don't have the same experience in life. And yet, there is a unity that's in Christ. So much as the church excels in that, the church grows in what it looks like to walk in godliness. And then, and then here's the last one. When we're growing in faith, the church, look at verse 40 here, encourages one another. It says they are ready to leave town, leave the city. They go out of the prison, and before they leave, they go back to Lydia's house, and they see the brethren, and they encourage them, and then depart. You see, when we're growing in our relationship with Christ, we're growing in encouragement toward one another. And in that encouragement... I think looks different than what the world understands that word to be. Encouragement in, in our culture, I think a lot of times, is uh, reserved only for attaboys and smiles and good jobs. But the reality is the word really means to put in courage, right? To build up the courage that someone might have. Courage to follow the Lord. Courage to resist sin. Courage to do what is right. Courage to walk in godliness, that what it means to really encourage one another is to lay down our preferences, to care for one another, to have a spirit of generosity and hospitality, to walk in such a way that we might spur one another on to be more and more in Christ in our lives. And so, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to sing a last song. But as we, we go forth this week and we, we navigate the craziness of winter and weather and life, uh, that we would hold together as a, as a community of faith, a transformative understanding of Christ, one that produces in us a generosity and a hospitality that cares deeply for others, one that produces in us a desire to praise the Lord in all circumstances, that produces in us a faith that causes us to love people of all walks and a faith that produces in us a desire to deeply encourage one another. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, I pray that we would be a people marked by a real transformative faith in you. That we would grow in this. That we would be a people who each and every day recognize our sin and our failure and our shortcoming and and yet we would turn those over to you trusting you to make us more and more like you that that you would conform us to your image that you would transform our hearts and then that you would produce in our hearts a spirit of generosity Make us a hospitable and loving people. Make us a people who praise you in all circumstances. Make us a people who encourage and love one another well. Help us with it, Lord. Help us to do better and better. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.